This program and its contents are designed for information and educational purposes only. This program does not render medical advice or professional services and is not intended to be a substitute for professional care. The information provided here should not be used for the purposes of diagnosing or treating a medical or psychiatric condition. If you have or suspect you may have a health problem, consult your health care provider. Hi, welcome to Positive Momentum TV. I'm Diane Silva, and today we're going to start talking about Alzheimer's. Um, I got to commend and thank those courageous people who are family members and those with Alzheimer's and the Alzheimer's Association for working with us this, uh, for the next couple of weeks while we cover Alzheimer's and try to demystify and help those who maybe need help and help you find a direction or support groups or whatever it is you're doing. Um, and again, I, my guest today is Diane Silverati. She's a family member of an Alzheimer's patient and she's in from Connecticut. Her mother is an Alzheimer's patient and she's also my mother-in-law. And Diane has graciously agreed and courageously agreed to come on and help us talk about the caregiving aspect, how the support, the dual relationships, the relationships, anything we actually cover. This is a difficult topic for anyone, especially those who are close to this um, horrible disease. It doesn't just impact the person who has Alzheimer's, it really impacts the family. Diane, would you like to kind of just speak a little bit about um, your relationship with the Alzheimer's in general, or, you know, or okay, your experience. Uh, my experience, it. well, let me see if I can, um, so I've, I guess I've been involved with Alzheimer's for, I don't know, it could be like close to 10 years. Right. Um, my mother was probably undiagnosed Alzheimer's for a number of years mm -hmm. um, before she had a stroke three years ago. And when she had the stroke, it gave her vascular dementia on top of the undiagnosed Alzheimer's. So she kind of got a double whammy. Um, I live 1,500 miles away right. from her, so I would experience, when she would come to visit or I would come here to visit, I would begin to see a degradation in memory okay. and a looping factor and just, you know, you'd see signs. And it would always be attributed to um, getting old. Right. Um, and, but it didn't seem like it was the normal getting old process, but it was, I mean, it was difficult. Now that she, I mean, so that was the progression over the years. Um, since she had the stroke three years ago, she's been here. Uh, she's no longer able to care for herself. So she is um, in, a in a wonderful residency uh, that specializes in memory care. It's, uh, and you know, it's a really good thing. Um, living with Alzheimer's is an interesting thing. Um, I, living long distance, I try to visit as often as I can. Yes. Um, one, to see her while she still knows who we are, and two, to really help my the two of you. <laughs> this is kind of strange. Yeah, That's the two right. of you, my brother and my sister-in-law, um, as, as you are the primary caregivers for mom, and I do what I can to come and help you and relieve some of the stress, whatever it is that you need done. So I come for two reasons, to see her, support her, and to support you guys. And one of the things, we, we, it, we, we joke about it, but it's, it's really, it's not really funny. Every time you come, one of us gets sick or both of us get sick. It's like, our, you know, you show up and our bodies just say, okay, we can't do this anymore. And right. we, we let go and we literally mm -hmm. get physically ill from all the stress we've been dealing with. Well, your resistance now, yeah. Right, we don't realize. And that's one of the things why we're doing these shows is to show, you know, to help the caregivers, help the people who are undiagnosed, help anybody who wants help, help you find direction, understand that this is, you know, there is help out there, there's support. And even long distance, you have been a godsend. I don't know how many times. Well, thank you. You know, where, you know, we'll get the calls three, four hundred times. And that's an exaggeration, but we will get at least 20 sometimes inside of 15 minutes. And we have to finally say, ah, oh, we can't do this anymore. We'll text you and say, can you take it? And right. you're really good at getting off the ledge. Um, yeah, I mean, I find, so that's, you know, part of being long distance is I'm not in the thick of it. 
mm -hmm. um, as often. Although she does, you know, um, she does call when she can't get a hold of you guys, so that mm -hmm. happens. Right. Um, or if you guys contact me and just, you know, and ask to kind of help diffuse the situation, you're unable, you're busy, you're unable, unable to take her call at the moment. Um, and I find when I talk to her that I have a specific job, I have a specific role, um, especially long distance, and it's really, it's to help diffuse the situation. If she's very, very upset and something's going on, then, you know, my job is to calm her down. Right, but and our job is to make sure that you're aware of what's going on so you can at least fill her in on the blanks that you may not know what's going yeah. on if you're not here. I can, I mean, yeah, I mean, y you absolutely can do that. Um, you let me know what's been going on in your lives so I can reassure her at times about things that are going on in, with the family and that's always a good thing. So us keeping in touch has always been very important. Um, but also, for the most part, I have a pretty good sense of what I need to do right. to reassure her. And that's just some, that can be just generic. It's like, yes, mom, um, you do talk to them almost on a daily basis. And, you know, you do see them. And here's family functions that you've been on. And they take pictures. And, you know, there are a lot of things and a lot of tools that we put in place that help her also. And I know what those are so I can reassure her over the telephone. Um, and truly, my job is to make her laugh. And, and you do a really good job of that. You really do. You, you, you I can just be really silly. And it's the silliest things that you can just come up and, and it'll make her laugh. And, that's, and that will help change the mood and, and bring her around. And, you know, at the end of the day is how she's feeling. And if she's feeling pretty good, I can get off the phone and, you know, but I'll spend a lot of time with her on the phone. And then, like I said, I come out a couple times a year. Mm -hmm. um, and my job here is a little different. I mean, it's to support everybody and the relationship's different when I'm here. Um, it's, you know, it is easier when you're, it's easy and it's hard. It's, it's, I, it's, it's easier to be detached from the patient when you're away so I can be more objective and I can right. be more supportive because I'm not in the emotional throes of what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, however, the flip side of that coin, the double-edged sword, right, mm -hmm. is I'm long distance. So she's progressing in the disease and um, and you're away from it. And so you kind of, you, you know, at one point in time, at some day, she's not going to be able to use the telephone. What right. does that mean? I mean, living long distance, that's going to be huge. Right. So, you know, I don't, you know, it's, it's a tough one. It's a real tough one, you know. which is why I come as often as I do. And it's both I'm courageous enough to be able to, right? And it's both courageous and commendable. You know, I mean, not ev like you said, not everybody can. Yeah. You know, but everybody, most everybody, has access to a phone at least until the patient can, or the victim. I don't know what's the correct verbiage to use or politi politically correct because it's both. They're both a patient and a victim. You know. They're also a person. Right. So you know, the, the, the Alzheimer's, end. the person dealing or suffering mm -hmm. with Alzheimer's. Right. It may be the best way to look at it. And they are a person. And we have, um, without going into too much detail, there was an, your mother, your mother Pat is it's great social. I mean, she is a social butterfly. She's, you know, she is the, the bell of the ball, so to speak. And she is very engaging. Mm -hmm. she, she really enjoys mm -hmm. socializing and everything. And there was this lady who last year was further ahead, you know, I mean, when I say further ahead, I mean she was more lucid, more cognitive, less mm -hmm. less advanced. And now that lady has passed her immensely. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at Pat going, okay, I know she's de declining in the disease, luckily at a very slow pace, comparatively speaking. Absolutely. You know, yeah. everybody's mm -hmm. an individual going to go at their own pace, but mm -hmm. I look at this other lady who was in a better place, than, you know, a more lucid place than Pat, now she is quite deteriorated in the disease. The yes. disease has taken its toll, but that woman's still there. You know, you can see her, you can see her, but you know, people say, oh, there's, it's just a shell. No, that per you know, if you can give a person a hug and they smile, they're still there. True, so absolutely. It, it's, it's, it, you don't know what, you don't know, you really don't know what's gonna reach them. Right. You know, and, and what they're, rec rec what they're gonna recognize and what not, you're right. You know, and that, that book, um, there's a book out it's called Give Moments of Joy. Creating or, Moments of Joy by right. Jolene Brackey. Yeah, it's a fabulous, fabulous book. That really, really helped me 
a lot reading that. I remember when Chris suggested it, um, and I read it cover to cover, highlighted all kinds of things through it. It just it resonated with me a lot um, because it changed my perspective in in that I can't expect her to be who she was or to respond as I would respond to any conversation, to any situation. It's she's not going to respond like she did in the past. Right. Um, it's just not that way and she's not going to remember and the amount of energy that I need to put in it's like my energy needs to be different it's like I can't direct all my energy at trying to make her remember things that she's forgotten because she'll get frustrated she does um, she'll feel bad she does and so the energy, so it's, and, and at the end of the day, she's not going to remember it. Right. So even if you focus on trying to get her to remember in a minute, five minutes, 10 minutes, what, however long it is, she's going to forget again anyway. So it's like figuring out where to redirect your energies. And that's, I, I love the name of the book. It's creating moments of joy. Cause I really, that to me says everything about the book. It's like it, she need, it's how she feels in any one particular moment. And if we can make her feel good, she may not know why. I mean, yeah. we've had situations, in con I've had conversations with her where she says, you know, I don't, can't tell you what I did today. And it's like, yeah, I get that. But how do you feel? Well, I feel good. I mean, I feel good. Well, then you must have done something that made you happy or right. something like that. She doesn't remember what she did, but she knows how she feels in any one particular time. Right. Just like when we have disagreements or something like that. She right. won't remember what she said to us, but she knows how she feels. And she knows she feels bad about what she said. She can't tell you what she said. Right. You know, and so that she'll always, you know, feel bad about that. And then she'll apologize or something like that. But... Yeah, so it's, it's really, it's about figuring out moments of joy and how to change and how to interact with them on a different, ba differently, because they aren't the same person. Right, and, and with that, it's, it's retraining ourselves mm -hmm. to A, not take stuff too personally. And it's really hard because some of the stuff they say in, in a moment, in an instant, mm -hmm. they may or may not mean, you know, but it, it stings. And we have mm -hmm. to kind of go, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah, um, there's no reason for doing it, but by the time we react, they've forgotten it. Mm -hmm. So it, it's finding a way to retrain ourselves. It's, the whole relationship is different. Mm -hmm. And speaking of relationships, you have a dual relationship with your mother. You have the long distance relationship. We kind of touched on this a little bit. Mm -hmm. And your relationship with her is changing constantly due to the fact that part of it is the disease, mm -hmm. is the fact, you know, giving her those moments of joy and sometimes we have to meet them where they are mm -hmm. you know it's can you kind of uh, just speak to that just um, I'll try <laughs> um, the best you can do I mean well like I said when I when I'm when I'm at home when I'm at my home right um, my relationship with her is just it's one over the conversation and 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 I can spend an hour and a half on the phone with her and we'll just talk about the same thing pretty much over and over again and mm -hmm. you know it's just and, and we'll laugh and and you know we'll catch up and I'll help her remember things and so you know it's 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 conversational mm -hmm. when I'm here it's visiting her and we do have a different relationship because I am here um, I don't I you know I'm, when you talk about dual relationship, I'm kind of struggling with where you want to go. With, you know. It doesn't matter. I mean, we don't have a direction we're going to go or no material motive. I'm just trying to help people understand that you, you know, like with you, you get a unique perspective is maybe where I want to go okay, from. Okay, all right. Let's go with that, the unique well, I perspective. Think, so I think part of it is, is, is um, I do see, because I come here as frequently as I do, and I do talk to her frequently, I do see see her in two different ways, or I experience the situation in okay. two different ways, from a distance, right. and how, like I said, how easy it is kind of to detach from her, but then I also experience it in a way where I am part of what goes on on a day to I'm very aware of what you guys experience as the day-to-day -day caregivers, so the, um, the frequency of calls, the frustration, the um, 
that she experiences when she doesn't get a hold of you, um, the daily contact that you have. I don't experience daily contact with her unless she's in, in a loop or depending upon the time of the year or something like that, because I will go through cycles. Well, I'll hear from her on a daily basis and that'll mm -hmm. last for about a week and then we go back into our weekly, you know, couple of times a week phone call, that type of thing. But I can have a detached relationship living there, but I also truly understand what it's like for you guys on a day-to-day -day basis. And I can appreciate it. That's why I come as often as right. I do to help relieve that stress because I do really appreciate what you guys are doing, the fact that you do have the immediate daily, if you didn't live here, it'd be a t you'd also have that detached relationship right. too. And we yeah. don't get to see it from that aspect. We're so in the middle of everything. It's kind of like watching your kids grow up, yeah. you know, and you're kind of going, okay, when, you know, and then one day they go, oh my gosh, when did you get so big? Where, you know, you're kind of looking at, you see the kids one day and then you come back and see them six months later or whatever, and you've seen the changes. Yeah where you can see with like your mom, mm -hmm. where we're kind of in the middle of it and in the throes of it. And you get to the point where it's like after 20 calls in one day, you're just going, I can't answer the phone again. I just can't deal with this. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and trying to change our own dynamics and live our lives. And yes, she is a, in a facility, but we're still caregivers. That's exactly you're still right. a caregiver. We're, we're supporters. You know, they may take care of the day to day, but when it comes down to it, who does she call? She not calls. Ghostbusters. She calls us, she calls or she you guys. calls you. Yeah, you but know. she calls you guys because you are you. I mean, you all live in the same right. town, you know. So she's you've been the go-to forever, forever, you know. Right. And I haven't lived here, so yeah. But you're still very integral and and very supportive, and and we couldn't do this without you. We just couldn't. We we would. Well, you would. You you would. You would. But we would. We just would probably be closer to being in a facility ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> it would be. I mean, I, I and I do appreciate that I can. You know, that I can provide you the support, and and, and I appreciate what you're saying. Um, but I mean, you would do it. You, we all do what we have to do. That's exactly right. You know, and that's th right. There are um, Alzheimer's support groups. There are. Um, facilities that, in each facility, I mean, memory care facility, they have resources or they know where to get you resources. You know, um, the medical facilities, if you have any questions or any concerns with Alzheimer's or um, we're going to have a guest on who actually is an Alzheimer's patient, you know, has been diagnosed, a person diagnosed with Alzheimer's, young onset. Mm -hmm. And this person, we're going to get a better perspective on, you know, what it is from the inside. We're on the outside looking in mm -hmm. and watching. And sometimes for me, the only way I could keep my sanity, you know, as she's looping and, you know, some of the things they do. And it is not a pleasant experience for anybody to go through this, is to sit down. How would I want to be treated if it was me? Mm -hmm. What if I was the one sitting in her shoes? How frightened would I be? I mean, the anxiety she was going through at one point was horrendous mm -hmm. you know you that the double edge where oh I don't remember and then I don't remember again and then I remember that I don't remember you know and you're kind of caught in this mm -hmm. can you imagine that constant state of fear and panic you know so I have to kind of put myself there to be able to step back and say okay I have to put my own feelings aside mm -hmm. you know and just how can I serve you Great. how can I help you get you in because all we can do is ever give them the moments which is some of the things we are doing is the pictures you know we try to take pictures with her in it every event she goes Absolutely. to um, we do a uh, daily journal or right. anytime somebody comes to visit we ask them to mm -hmm. sign a visitor book mm -hmm. um, right now we're ta we're kind of taking and combining the two and taking pictures and typing out and then sending Put, printing it all off on one page and putting it in her book. Yeah. So we now have a picture book because sometimes by the time she's at the end of a sentence, she's forgotten what the beginning of the sentence is. That's very true. It is very so, true. Yeah, I think I, some of the tools that we've created in her room um, to help her, again, double-edged sword, because, and I've experienced that in, in phone calls with her or even just, you know, visiting her is um, when she looks at the pictures, and she sees them, there's no recognition. Right. She doesn't 
she doesn't know that she was there at that event or you know on that trip or whatever it is mm -hmm. and that's very frustrating to her that right. she I mean she it, she's happy that she sees them and that and that they're there and you know and looking at them they bring her some joy but then they bring her sadness too that's tough right. is because she has the recognition that she doesn't know and she doesn't remember and that's and that's the sad part of it and that'll frustrate her and so and you reassure and that kind of thing but so it is and that's hard because you, you're trying to do something to bring her some joy and it brings her sadness too and that's hard and it's hard to figure out you know where where do you you know you can't just stop no. because that she would lose any moments and then you're just kind of sitting there and it becomes her version of what being put away is like and that's one of the things we any of these facilities have nothing to do with being put away. What they do is, the ones I've experienced, the memory care facilities, it's an independent or assisted living with full memory support where mm -hmm. they keep them active, they keep them engaged. As, you know, They may not remember two seconds before, but they're at least treated with dignity, mm -hmm. respect. They go, I mean, she goes out for pie every Wednesday. Absolutely. You know, and loves Absolutely. those field trips. You know, she looks forward to getting out. You walk her out the door. Yippee, I'm free. We're kind of going, well, you weren't, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're really blessed because she is, she is able to afford to live in a, in, a, in a residency that provides her all of that kind of support. Not everybody has that. You know, I mean, right. while I've been here, the various different times that I've been here, and I've gone to support groups with you guys, right? right. right? And just and and just experiencing and listening to other people and their experiences, and and everybody has a different experience. But some people are caring for their loved one in their home, yes, on a daily, hourly, minute basis, all the time. We have, fortunately, the luxury, and it is a luxury, yes, to be is. able to have her have the care that she has in the residence. Um, and not everybody has that. Um, so it's, part of it is, and it's one of the things I think, what the thought that came to my mind as we were talking was, it's taking care of yourself. In order to be able to take care of your person, your loved one, whether they're in living with you or in living in a residence um, of some sort, is that you really have to focus on taking care of yourself because you're really not any good to that person if you're worn down and things like that. So it's taking, awesome moments for yourself um, and again that's kind of why I come as often as I do because it gives you guys a break send you off go do what you want to do and I'll do the daily you know the daily visits and conversations with her I'll take the phone calls and that kind of thing because you got to give yourself a break and you do and one of the there's two thoughts that came to mind is it does take a village mm -hmm. you know to to work through any of these diseases especially this one because you like you said you do need to take care of yourself and one of the things I have found and we've talked about it at different support groups, is normally the caretaker ends up dying before the Alzheimer's patient or the Alzheimer's person mm -hmm. because that Alzheimer's person really has no stress. I mean, they have the stress of the disease, mm -hmm. but the stress on the caretaker and the support is intense where, like they said, we get sick when you come in. Mm -hmm. That's an indication that we are overdoing it. Mm -hmm. You know, we need more help. And you only have, you we're limited. A lot of people are limited on how much help we can get. Exactly, exactly. You know, maybe there's only so many family members. Maybe there's only so much money. Maybe there's only That's right. whatever. And there's people who have to do it all by themselves. Right. But there are a lot of but there are a lot of programs and support groups and things like that to get help and to get ideas um, on taking care of yourself, taking care of your loved one, that kind of thing. And I think, I, you know, I'm encouraged by your series here. You know, being able you're being able to bring those that kind of knowledge out to people because you know not everybody knows about it. Right, and we will be having, um, like I said, an Alzheimer's person with Alzheimer's, his spouse. Mm -hmm. We will have people from the Alzheimer's Association. Mm -hmm. We're going to have um, one of the uh, CEOs or COOs from one of the facilities, mm -hmm. who's also a family member, mm -hmm. and then we're going to have a nursing director who's also a family member, and her mother-in-law who's her father-in-law is actually a patient um, Alzheimer's. So we're going to do our best to really cover this. You know, mm -hmm. we, we're starting with the support side because normally we're the ones that see it first, mm -hmm. you know, which 
we have a few minutes left. If, if there's any information you would like to share or you know, pointers you'd like to give anyone, you know, this would be a great time to kind of interject. And you know, we don't have the answers, none of us do. And I do wanna thank you for your courage and, and compassion and understanding and your ability to come out and be here to help not just us, but to help anybody who's needing it or interested in helping. Thank you. So, if, you know, if you have any pointers or any, any advice, any comments, any wrapping up thoughts, we have about a couple minutes left. And I, I would just, just, you know, I mean, I kind of, it would be kind of repeating what I've said. It's just learning to take care of yourself um, in order to be able to care for your loved one. And then just, I can't, I, I can't recommend enough that book called Creating Moments of Joy. Um, and I don't mean to plug it, but it just really, there was so much of the book and anybody can take what they can from it. Right. Um, but ev even the little things, and it kind of helped. I, I find it helped a lot, helped me a lot because I was able to put things in a different perspective, which I'm able to do most of the time because ultimately I can't, you know, living long distance, I can walk away from the immediate situation, so I know it's harder on a day-to-day -day basis, but it is it is something, you know, it's a good tool, and there are many good reads and tools and support groups, and use them. And you don't have to do it by yourself. That's the key, is you don't have to do it by yourself. And that's, that's really good to know. I mean, we didn't know that, and that's one of the reasons we want to do this show, is to make sure that information is out there. You're not alone, you know? It, it's, it's a tough thing to deal with, and there's moments, things you do have to do on your own. You have to deal with this by yourself, mm -hmm. but you don't have to do it by yourself. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like being sick. Yeah, you're the one who has to go through this, but right. exactly. you can have people helping you. Mm -hmm. And with that, we're going to wrap this up. We will have the Alzheimer's Association website. I'm thinking it's alzheimers.org. We'll have it out there on the website. And I look forward to seeing you on the next couple of shows. And it's going to be very informative. I hope you get something or whatever it is you need out of it. And please contact us if you have any questions. Thank you for watching Positive Momentum TV. See you next time.